Thank you, and you'll have to pardon my uh, inability to speak French. I'm going to talk to you today about innovation. And what I'm really interested in is how innovation happens and how we can teach innovation. And you might think that innovation would normally happen as a result of good planning ahead. We simply plan a giant scientific conference or we have a giant funding institute and we create innovation ahead of time. But the truth of the matter is the history of innovation throughout human history is actually more of a story of accidental science and random luck than good planning. And I want to share with you a study of an adhesive based on gecko foot that myself and several other colleagues have developed that builds on this theme, and it's called Gexkin. Nature provides a whole bounty of innovations, ranging from flight in birds that have feathers, or the pharyngeal jaws of moray eels that are essentially like a second set of jaws that reach out like an alien and grab their prey and allow them to eat octopuses and fish, or the toe of geckos that allows them to climb smooth walls. Gecko adhesion is a particularly exciting and interesting area of biomimicry, as this field is called. And that's because geckos, the topaz of geckos have traits that are not found in any kind of man-made adhesive. Gecko adhesive is distinctive because it has the, the topads can produce tremendous forces. A gecko is, such as the size of the one I have here can produce a force of about 20 newtons. And when it, oh, there he is. And that's only with the two front feet. That's equivalent to about a bag of 20 apples. But at the same time, they can reverse their toe pads very easily, and their adhesion is what is called dry adhesion. It leaves no residue at all. These geckos have really inspired humans for millennia, and yet until recently, there's been no man-made gecko adhesive that was present that we could use for our own purposes. But could you imagine all the potential uses for a gecko-like adhesive? So imagine that TV that you spent the whole day putting up on the wall and for which your husband or your wife yelled at you. Wouldn't it be nice just to take that TV and put it on the wall, and if your husband and wife yelled at you, remove it and put it somewhere else? Wouldn't it be nice, for example, to have a Band-Aid you could put on your hand, and if you're a particularly hairy person, rip it off and not say, ouch. These are the kinds of things that you could get if you had a gecko-like adhesive. So it should come as no surprise to you that there has been really a frantic international search for a gecko-like adhesive over the past decade. And you might think, therefore, that the early beginnings of gecko adhesion were similarly exciting, but in fact, they had very humble beginnings. Beginning in the 1940s, a whole range of scientists studied gecko adhesion in very simple and even silly experiments. They put geckos in containers that had a vacuum to see if they could still cling. They could. They put, they tested which materials geckos could cling to. And the outcome of this work was essentially that geckos stick to walls the same way that tape sticks to walls, through van der Waals forces. Van der Waals forces are forces that are ubiquitous between any two surfaces. The reason why you are not sticking to your chair is you simply cannot get close enough, no matter how hard you try. But tape actually creates van der Waals forces by means of a honey-like adhesive. And this honey-like adhesive gets very close to surface and creates van der Waals forces getting quite strong. The, this kind of bond, which is called a viscoelastic bond, however, has some severe limitations. One of them is that this bond, when you use it over and over again, changes, and so tape only works for a certain period of time. Second, this bond only works at a very small scale. If you want to, for example, hang 700 pounds from the ceiling, then you can't use duct tape. You're going to have to use something else. Gecko adhesion, on the other hand, is elastic. It bonds easily and comes off easily. And the reason the way geckos actually bond to surfaces and again, my gecko keeps moving here, there you are, is through these miniature hairs that are found in their feet called setae. These miniature hairs are very small, they're microscopic, and they bond to surfaces, and they create van der Waals forces. So therefore, it's, it's not surprising that the first thing people have tried to do is to make artificial setae. And these setae, they simply have tried to create them, but with little success. Cetae actually don't really work very well. Most of the gecko-like adhesives that people have tried to create only work at very small scales. They've not been able to make 
very large adhesives that can hold large weights. So how do we scale adhesion to large sizes? That is really the, one of the most interesting questions we can ask. How do we go from something the size of a small beetle beyond the size of a gecko to something like the size of a gorilla? And in order to do that, we need to actually go beyond what nature has done, because nature is only designed for what's good for a gecko. If we want to design an adhesive that works on the scale of a gorilla, then we have to actually over use human ingenuity to match nature's ingenuity. So this is where actually my own personal story comes into play. When I was an undergraduate in the 1990s, I worked with my advisor, Jonathan Losos, at the University of California, Davis. And he and I talked about how it would be really great to measure how much force a gecko topaz could produce. And it turns out we had the tools to do that. We actually had a force plate that could measure the forces that geckos could produce. And this is an image from those experiments, actually. Um, well, I'll show you in a minute. But what, it, what we had is we actually, you would like to say that it was very sexy and exciting science, but the, it really wasn't. It was very simple science. We used a simple force plate. I used to go to hardware stores and try and find materials that geckos would cling to. I ended up using this material in the force plate, which if you recognize is a simple overhead sheet. Turns out geckos cling very well to it. And the outcome of this work is that the geckos about the size of what you see here can produce around 20 newtons of force to the two front toes. That's about a bag of 20 apples. That's an enormous amount of force. And they can peel it off very easily. And this really set the standard for synthetic biologists to try and make a synthetic gecko-like adhesive. So I'm going to show you a brief movie of a gecko in my laboratory. Her name is Big Mama. Big Mama is a really awesome gecko. And I want to assure you that she's not under any kind of duress. I know it looks like I'm doing some kind of medieval torture, but I'm not. These geckos are not hurt by this. I think what you'll see from this video is she's trying really, really hard. She's actually using her whole body, which indicates to me it's not simply the hairs in her toes. It's actually other elements for anatomy that are playing a key role in adhesion. And as you can see, she's, OK, maybe she's a little unhappy about it. <laughs> but you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs, right? And it turns out that, indeed, that the anatomy of geckos is, has, plays a key role in their adhesion. If you look at the anatomy of a gecko toe, they have some really cool tendons. Do you, any of you know what tendons are? Tendons are elastic structures that usually connect bone to muscle. For example, you can think of your Achilles tendon. In, and they're really cool because they're elastic, and yet they're stiff. In ancient times, people took animals that they had killed and harvested tendons and made giant catapult springs from them and you know, threw giant vats of boiling oil all over people. And in geckos, tendons play a very different role. They actually connect bone to skin. The bone, their tendon goes from the bone of the toe into the skin, and then that skin goes into the soft pad that attaches to surfaces. So what you have is a very stiff surface, a tendon, attaching a very soft surface. And it turns out this combination of stiff and soft is really the secret to gecko adhesion. It's not the hairs. The hairs are actually relatively unimportant. And it's, this allows these geckos to adhere at very high levels. So this is where, actually, we come to the present. A few years ago, a, a really brilliant scientist by the name of Al Crosby emailed me and wanted to know if I wanted to work with him on some theories of gecko adhesion he had been studying. Turns out he didn't really, he knew about my work. He didn't really realize I was at the same university as he was until I responded to his email, which is again a case of happy accidental science. We've become good friends, have worked ever since. In February of this year, we actually published a paper on the invention of gecko skin, which is a synthetic gecko adhesive that builds on the anatomy of gecko feet. It has a fake tendon, fake skin, and a fake pad. And these three elements together create adhesive of unparalleled strength and reusability. And I should also point out that two other key people were involved in this, Mike Bartlett and Dan King, who are really outstanding scientists. And I mentioned to you that it'd be really great to hang your TV. So let's do that. Let's hang a 42-inch screen TV. It's also my collaborator's TV. These are some, this is a sheet of glass against a metal frame. 
Any of you who've picked up a 42-inch screen TV and tried to put it in a wall know that it's a really a, a giant pain in the rear. This is Gek skin that he's attaching. It's about four square inches, about the palm of your hand's hand. It has a tendon that it goes from it into the TV, and you can just attach it. He's a little bit more nervous than usual because there's no crash pads, and again, it's my collaborator's TV, so, which is also happens to be his advisor. Now they can sit down, relax, enjoy some wonderful programming. In this case, they can enjoy and I totally approve of this, images of gecko morphology. And once they are done, they can then proceed on to other fun things. So you can begin to see from this the potential for this kind of adhesive. This adhesive actually produces adhesive forces at very large scales and can be used in homescapes, can be used for industrial design, for construction, for medical purposes. Finally, when these students are done watching their exciting gecko images, they can simply get up and say, OK, I'm done. That's the end of that. I'm going to get up and I'm going to peel this off. And that's one of the key traits of gecko adhesion is that it produces high forces, and yet it's easy to remove. And that's what they can do here. With simply a twist of his wrist, it comes off, voila. That's my only French I've been able to use today. So in all, a, gecko, a, a piece of gecko skin about the size of my hand can hold about 700 pounds or 300 kilograms on glass. This is 300 pounds on glass. It leaves no residue. You can just stick it on with your hand. It'll hold that much weight. You can peel it off with your hand. Furthermore, it is made of inexpensive materials like rubber and fiber and is very easily commercializable. So, this kind of brings the question, if we can make synthetic adhesives that surpass geckos, then why did geckos evolve these hairs in the first place if, we don't really, if they don't really need them? And it turns out, I think the answer to this is that the evolution of hairs is really a case of evolutionary accident. It's really a classic case of evolution and tinkering. These geckos evolved these hairs because they actually have on their own skin millions of little bumps shown here that were their evolutionary precursors to setae. And this idea of evolution and tinkering came from a French philosopher named Francois Jacob. And he argued that evolution takes structures and improves upon them. And that means that organisms are never perfect. They take what they have and they work on it, just like a tinkerer. And geckos fit that model very closely. And he talked about how this is a very different vision of evolution compared to all these uh, crazy animals that people imagine in the 16th century where they put a horse's head on a cow's body. They didn't understand how evolution worked. So I want to end, actually, which is a very passionate plea for how we should be teaching innovation to our younger people, because I think you'll see from the story of this Gexkin that it was not a case of exciting science the whole time it was evolving. It was a case of many different people working on obscure topics for many years. And finally, at the very end, a few people were able to create a substantial innovation. I think we should be encouraging young scientists to have the time and the space to be creative, to work on topics that may not seem exciting at the time. So I, my hope is that we can teach young people to become innovators by becoming tinkerers. And I hope that's an idea that Francis Jacob would approve of. Thank you very much.